my charge is briefly to remind all of us why we're here, what the point of something called The Current uh, is wanting to be, and uh, how we think this is serving some uh, valuable purposes in our community and in our county. So, um, two quick slides that talk about the initial goals that we laid out for the, the speaker series. Um, we envision this as a series that exists at the intersection of local history, community concerns, and contemporary culture. The intersection is white because that's a critical issue. Uh, we talk often in Beaver County in silos, and we need to think more deliberately across different kinds of domains of expertise, of experience, of community context, uh, on and on and on. So we have foregrounded a series of conversations that are intentionally at the intersection of, of life here in our region. And then secondly, uh, this is a series that provides a shared public dialogue around ideas shaping our region that seeks to describe and create our shared culture. There's a, a fundamental theory of change at the heart of what we're doing. We think that if and as we are able to speak more carefully, more deliberately, more in a more visionary way about the communities that we inhabit, we think that actually starts to do something to how we live here. Uh, if we talk about ourselves differently and envision ourselves differently, we actually start to bring about that different vision in the lives of our communities. And ultimately, the intent there is a, is a shared culture, that we're coming together over time in public space and creating something that didn't exist before we started, right? There's a, there are new connections that are being made, new understandings that are being discovered, and uh, new opportunities that we're uncovering together. And so those are the, uh, the I think at once, humble and visionary aspirations of the current. And I think to date, we've had uh, some pretty neat uh, speakers going at, at those goals. And so we're sure that tonight will be uh, another version of that. And we hope that you'll continue to be a part of that ongoing dialogue. Um, lose pictures on the screen. So I think that means I leave. Yeah. I'm in charge again. All right. <laughs> Go for it. All right. So um, I have the honor of introducing Lou Velotti. Um, he's one of my favorite community change makers. He is the president of the Beaver County Corporation for Economic Development, otherwise known as BCCED. He calls it CED because Beaver County is the most important CED. <laughs> um, he works really hard there as um, the executive director to advance significant industrial development in the county and also more recently to advance downtown borough development. Um, what I love about Lou is he's changed the focus of CED. We used to focus, CED used to focus purely on large industrial scale projects, and now he has a significant focus on the downtown boroughs and how to make them more, even more vibrant. And as he will say, probably in his talk today, he'll talk about dogs on leashes and strollers, that if we see that, we know we have a vibrant community. Lou is a uh, breath of fresh air to Beaver County. He brings years of experience. Um, previous to coming to us, he was the Director of Planning and Development with Southwestern. Hi, PA Hi. Commission. Hi, I was just talking about Lou, your favorite person. <laughs> Welcome, you guys. Um, so he was with the Southwestern PA Commission um, as the Director of Planning and Development, so he brings all that experience with him, which is great. And he also brings a long-term commitment to the county, because I just heard this for the first time yesterday. He said that um, it's his wife and his um, personal desire to retire in Beaver County. So he has a long-term investment with us also. He's also a beer aficionado, if you want to talk to him later about that. Um, but most importantly, like you, he thinks about how to make our community um, better, and he works every day, like all of you, to make those advances happen. With um, He brings innovation to his position. And what I also really like about him is he brings sensitivity to both our history and our potential. So please join me in welcoming Lou Velotti. Thank you, and the shoe's gonna get me a white screen, so I'm gonna draw and talk and move around a lot. So just be prepared for that. Um, what I'm gonna do today is show you how, or hope to show you, how a $10,000 mini grant for Ma and Pa Bagel will, is actually part of a multidisciplinary strategy that economic development strategy that will is designed to land worldwide widgets. 
And in the course of that, what I'm going to do is hope to share with you a little bit about what CED does, what economic development is, what our thought process is, and what my thought process is when it comes to economic development and community development. So I got 15 minutes to do that, and it's about an hour story, so we're going to do this really quick. I'm going to make a mess, and it's going to get really loud. Okay? So the first thing is, and she's, so I have a couple things that I got to say. She's already said one of them. Dogs and strollers. I sell dogs and strollers. I want to get all those things out of the way that people have heard me say before. I sell dogs and strollers. Um, you can't ask somebody to invest in your community unless you have a community worth investing in. Those are all things that I brought with me and I still believe. Uh, I'm going to take you through the basics of economic development, real high level. I'm going to talk about some of the different disciplines that are used, again, real high level. And because it's so high level and so fast, there are going to be plot holes. You'll see them. You don't have to point them out, but there'll be plot holes in this story. So economic development comes down to three basic things. I call it, uh, again, people have heard me talk, sorry, Rich, and any of a member of my boards that are here, they've heard me speak way too often. It comes down to three things. Start them, keep them and grow them, and catch them. And that's really stardom is your entrepreneurship strategy. A keep them and grow them is known as a retention and expansion strategy. And the catch them is your attraction strategy. I want to make that big because that's the one everybody loves. Real big, real sexy. That's the one everyone likes to see, attraction. Um, now, in those three basic strategies, that's what economic development is, but it's across a multiple of disciplines that you just about everybody uses, right? And so the disciplines are education, technical assistance. I'm going to make a circle here because this is what I'll get back to. Finance and money and real estate. So those are the basic disciplines. Those four are the disciplines we used for years for economic development. But there's a new discipline that's been around forever, but has not been really on the forefront of economic development for years and is now in ritual like this. It's workforce. And, and workforce has changed. So when I started, it was investment, jobs, people. We looked for investment to get jobs for people. People were out of jobs. Our, jo our job was to bring investment into an area so there were jobs for the people that lived there that had lost their jobs, right? It is now turned on its head. That's still true in some cases, but it is just as true, if not more true, that you were looking for people to fill jobs so that companies can make investment. And that's where we stand. So workforce has become a very critical part of economic development. So how does this all play together? Well, each of those disciplines fills those categories at different levels, at different intensities, and different styles. Real quick, I'll do it as fast as I can. Uh, but entrepreneurship, for example, education would be number one, right? technical assistance to, money three, and then so on and so on. For retention and expansion, it used to be just money. It's not the case anymore. Number one is money and workforce, without a doubt. Those are the top things that companies are looking for to help them expand and to keep them in a location. And then real estate and so on and so on. And attraction is always real estate first. But a real close second anymore, again, is workforce. So that's really the, the basic building blocks of economic development. The three strategies and the five disciplines. And they're all different levels. There are different types of, in each discipline that you apply to, to each of those categories. But how do we get from a $10,000 mini grant to Ma and Pa Bagel, to a multidisciplinary strategy that is designed to land worldwide widgets. OK, now bear with me. It starts by 
CED has, so we have a program called our Business District Initiative we recently started. There are nine historic riverfront um, downtowns in Beaver County. Those downtowns have roughly, the business districts in those downtowns have roughly at any given time around 800 storefronts. About at any given time, 200 to 300 of those storefronts are absolutely vacant. And during that period of time, you may have two to three of those two to 300 on a traditional real estate site. You may have 10 to 15 on the market. So you have 300 storefronts, 200 to 300 storefronts that are vacant, and you only have 10 to 15 of them on the market. Only a couple are on traditional market. Now if you go to our website, you'll be able to see the ones that, at least if they put a phone number in their window, we'll capture it on a quarterly basis and we'll put it on our website so when a company a business calls and says, hey, I want to start a business somewhere, you can come to us. All right? So we then took that the next step with our business district initiative. We now offer, if you start a business in one of those nine areas, we will offer you a $10,000 grant, reimbursable, if you have spent $20,000 on that storefront in that business in that given 12-month period. Right? So if you spend $20,000, it can be rent, utilities, um, equipment. It can't be personnel or that sort of stuff. But if you spend that money, we will reimburse you $10,000, courtesy, by the way, of the Appalachian Regional Commission. And we applied for a $600,000 grant that allow us to do that. So you're given $10,000, and it's to smart start a small business. So let's just start with, you're starting a small business, so already it's entrepreneurship. You're given a money. So it's over there with finance, right? And a, um, a part of our grant is you have to have a business plan. And so if you don't have a business plan, what we do is we send you to education. We send to one of our educational entities to help you write up a business plan and to give you technical assistance. So multidiscipline in entrepreneurship. But how does that get us over here? Right? Well, there's a reason that we focus on those nine municipalities and their business districts. It's because what we are trying to do is get investment, money, more investment into that, those specific areas for a reason. We want to make them, we want to increase the vitality of those areas. The more investments, the more business, the more dogs and strollers. And the more dogs and strollers, the more attractive that municipality becomes. And the more attractive those municipalities become, they begin to attract more people. And those people are able to supply our workforce. So what we're trying to do through this course of all these disciplines is to bring, make these so attractive that people want to use them. People say, hey, I can live here now. I can do that. I can go. She said, uh, Carrie said, I want to retire to Beaver County. Why do I want to? You know that I have, there's several communities here that I can walk to a grocery store, a, a pharmacy, a coffee shop, and a bakery all within walking distance in a community. You don't know how rare that is, not just in Beaver County in general, southwestern Pennsylvania in general, but the region. You have more active downtowns, small, small downtowns and business districts than any other county other than Allegheny County of the 10 that I used to work in. So that's a beautiful asset that you have to take advantage of. And what we want to do is we want to continue to bring investment into those so that they become attractive for people to want to live. And not only that, they become attractive for people to want to keep their businesses there and expand because now they have a workforce. They can see their citizens, they can see their employees working there. They can see their employees living there. They now know something's going on. It's worth us investing. You can't have a community, yes, can't somebody to invest in your community unless you have a community worth investing in. So that's what we're doing. And as we do that, we grow the workforce. We make the area attractive. What then happens is when I bring a, an inbound, what I call them, prospect, I don't drive them to 
the 60 acre and it, site they want to see first, I get off 376, and if it's in Westgate, I drive them through Beaver, I go up 51, I drive through Beaver, New Brighton, I drive through Beaver Falls, I drive them through the communities. So they can see themselves and their citizens, not just the citizens, but their employees, where they're gonna live. That whole idea of doing this is designed so that when I bring worldwide widgets into the county, they can see, that they can envision what's happening there. They can see, we can, we, if it's, this is a long play, but the people that, the reason I made attraction so big is not because it's the big sexy, it's because that's the business we have chosen. That's what we're in, every one of us. And it's not just attracting companies anymore. You are in the business of attracting people. This is horrible to say, but we now look in my field we now look at people the same way that we used to look at prospects. What can we do to bring people to our area? Because workforce, when you talk to any business, when you do business retention and expansion, it used to be taxes. It's not taxes anymore. It was then money, financing, not that problem. The first word out of their mouth, and Rich is here and he can tell you, because he works for the work in, in job training, the first words out of their mouth is, we need people. We can't find people. And we're not going to grow without people. And we're not going to get people unless we're attractive. And through that process is how we get to here. So that is a little bit about, I think I did it. I think I did it in my time frame. But that's a little bit about our philosophy and why we do what we do. Historically, where we're, as Carrie said, we were industrial base. We, have, we, we still have them, industrial parks. Uh, we have a couple, we have industrial properties. We have space that we lease to folks. Uh, we have about 800,000 square feet of industrial space that we lease to different people. We have our own industrial parks, but that was economic development, 1980, 1990. Economic development, 2020 and beyond is about making your places attractive so that people want to be there. And, by, and so this strategy that is multidisciplinary and an integrated strategy com it covers the whole spectrum of communities that we are trying to serve. It, ser it serves the small town community development. It serves the companies that are here that want to grow and stay here and it serves those companies that are looking to come here. And we give everybody a fair shot. And so that's what we're trying to do. So I hope that explained it. I don't know if I'm supposed to ask questions, answer questions now, later. I know if I was too fast, talked too loud, told them I was going to make a mess. I promised I would. I did. So any questions? Yes. Well, see, there's a, there's, so education plays in these different ways across the board, and, and education is uh, a very important topic when it comes to attracting people. Because you want these young families to build the right. communities and to help the school districts. It's almost as if uh, Freedom Area School District has lost its passion. It's the, what I will tell you is that's not uncommon throughout the region and throughout uh, public education in general. What is different about Beaver County and is what I tell my prospects when they come in is there are there's a group in Beaver County that's trying to fix it. At least they're trying to. You know, and they brought folks in to take a look at it and will it be successful? Who knows? But they've recognized the issue. They're doing their best to try to fix it and that's what but that is a that is a major issue. The other thing that we call what we do when we attract people is is what this is I hate to use jargon that we've kind of developed in the economic development field, but we call this urban light because what folks are looking for, um, a, a lot of the, the, the pre folks that wanted to live in the city, the young kids that wanted to move into the Pittsburgh and those kind of places, uh, what we found out very early on is they, they age out of that as well. But they don't age out of it the same way that former generations did by wanting to buy the half-acre home in, out in a subdivision 
they would rather be in a place where they get a lot of the same feel as they had in an urban area. So there's, so there's, it's walkable, there's access to transit, and just as important, they can be involved in the community. Another thing that I sell when I talk to people about this is you can become, come to Beaver County and be a part of it. You know, they're trying to do things in these communities. They want you here. They want your business here to come and help. And you know that you'll be a valued member if you participate and volunteer for us. But that's a very important, you're, you're absolutely right. It's one of the hardest things to overcome, but it's not just here. It's, that's kind of the good news. When I worked regionally, I can't tell you, and I worked 10 counties, people would call all the time, see, I cannot see planning development, and economic development person for the region. They'd call, my husband just got transferred. How can I move to South Fayette Township? Right? How do I get into the South Fayette School District? And they would call, and I said, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta buy a house. It's, I can't find a house there. Well, there's a reason for that. But uh, we're beginning to see those things change slowly, but you're absolutely right. Education plays a very big part. Yes? No, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Who's raising their hand? Go ahead. We are trying to bring the bridge here, and I heard that you say that you you are so um, industrial property. You have property, so we was looking for a place where we can um, actually start a development. Well, give me a call. I'll have my card before you leave, and and we'll definitely talk. Um, they were granted before Tom was left. It's called the Bridge Ecosystem by CEO. trying to bring that here um, where we can have a cluster of businesses. I actually want to actually extend it mostly to our um, low income because we're, we're I actually do training right now. We do CDL training, computer training. I actually am white labeled now with um, uh, MedSir as well as um, QS Academy. And I everything is free with us. We have been working with our low-income community, but we want to so, merge it all so together. One of the things that I haven't put down on here is, and, and I have a lot of my partners in the room, um, is that we don't, work in, we don't work in silo anymore. That's done, right? So we have, um, because of these different disciplines and these different locations, we have various groups that we have to talk, that we work with. And we work with education uh, um, groups. Um, we work with uh, workforce folks. We work with... Um, the, the, the county we work with, we work with a myriad of groups, part, regional and local, because you can't do this in a silo anymore. If you're going to create this, this, this strategy this, with all these disciplines, nobody can do this one discipline. And no organization can do this one discipline. So you have to open up yourself to partnerships. And so that's what, and that's what we strive to do. I'm assuming she was next to that. I'll get you, Maria. Uh, I don't know. I would call it the, the Louvre. <laughs> we, we used to have, we, jokingly, we used to have a joke for it. We call it the Louvalotti liv livability model, the, uh, the LVLM. Uh, but no, it's, it is not a model that it is simply um, that, that we took anywhere. It is, this is what we do, and this is how we do it. And it's simply uh, the idea for us, was the innovation for us was realizing that we needed to um, do to the entire spectrum and that it could be integrated. It's not anything that I learned anywhere. It's just 30 years of economic development, working with folks, uh, Penn State uh, in Altoona, coming down off the hill in Altoona. Um, we believe that there has to be institutional investment into these downtowns to spur private investment, hence a project that CED uh, got involved with here, the Beehive Building. It was That's an effort of to have private institutional investment, us, purchase a building and redo it in a downtown so that it can begin to spur other private development and investment. So there's, there's no, no name to it.
So, so the, the criteria for attraction is different for depending upon what you're looking to attract. People are totally different than uh, business or industry, and businesses will, t will, will be different depending upon, um, depending upon what their needs are. All right? so, but generally, for people, what we're looking to do is to make attractive areas, and that really is uh, a vitality score of areas that are walkable, ideally, uh, have recreation close by, but really have in their business district, in their, on their street level business district storefronts, are, are places that are entertainment, restaurants, um, those sort of places that attract people and increase the vitality level. And we do work with uh, town center associates in um, downtown properties, and they have a vital vitality score that they, will, that they calculate for us depending upon the types of businesses that are there. And it's shown to be effective in places like if you've been to Carnegie lately, um, great Italian, new Italian restaurant in Carnegie. If you haven't been there, Lugretta. Uh, um, they have um, in, in Mount Lebanon and in those places where they, and on Beverly Street in Mount Lebanon, that sort of has shown that it can work. And, and Carnegie is totally changed because in the last five years, based upon the ideas and concepts that they've done here, We've just taken it one step further and said, we see this as an attractive way, as a great way to not only invest in those communities and do those things, but also get the workforce that's going to be needed. I, I feel personally that the group, the place that can solve or partially solve the workforce issue is going to be the place that ultimately, if there is such a thing, wins in this discussion. because. Nobody, the first question folks come to us, we have to sit down and we have to do a workforce shed and we have to show them where they can get their, where they can get employees from. Maria? Right now we market it to the, uh, direct to the communities and then we have done a direct to property owner. It hasn't worked real well. So what I mean by that is we've told property owners, hey, you can tell folks if they start a business here, they're eligible for $10,000 to be able to get that. So it, the, our marketing has not reached where it needs to be yet. We've only had, and it's kind of good at the moment because um, I'm, we made it up. Uh, this $10,000 mini grant, we made it up. Um, we made up the program ourselves. We decided what it was going to look like. We sold it to ARC, Appalachian Regional Commission. They said, sure, Lou. Nobody's ever done this like this before. Why don't you do it and see if it works and see how it? So we're kind of learning as we go. Uh, but uh, everybody here can be. Uh, I have a. I have an applicant in the room, uh, and so. But I mean, everybody here um, can. You know, go to our website. It's there. We've got it out to the municipalities. But generally, that's where they're coming from. And I can tell you also, and this is not a. a Hope and affront to some of these these communities. Um, the I can tell where I'm going to get them from by how active their administrators are. So the places that have good uh, administrators, good municipal administrators, those are where I'm getting my applications from, because they're reaching out and doing that. We just recently have, are getting there. So I have brought um, Riverside Center for Innovation off the North Shore. Uh, Juan Garrett, if anybody knows Juan Garrett in the room. Uh, they're, they're in the city of Pittsburgh. They're very active. Um, they're very active for, in, in all honesty, they do a lot of community benefit stuff for companies that are coming in there. He's, uh, he's very active in the underserved communities. So we have just, they're now in our office, not in our office, sorry, they're in the Beehive building two days a month for six hours a day. They have Build Back Better funds, which are designed to go towards tech. Tech is the hard, uh, will be the hard nut for Beaver to, County to crack. Here's why. Real simple, I'll do it as fast as I can. Um, uh, who likes to go to the beach on vacation, right? So I'm not, I'm not going to get into location quotients and all that fancy stuff. If you like to go to the beach on vacation, when you're looking for a vacation spot, you're not looking, you don't look at Aspen, Colorado. 
right? Or you don't look in, in the mountains of North Carolina, you look at the places in the beach. And so tech companies like a certain thing and, and they aim for that certain thing. So you can, so we, tend, we have a higher location quotient, and I'm gonna get into all that, in manufacturing, so manufacturing companies look here. It's, it's, so we do, you can change that, because for example, I never thought, if I had to put on shoes, it wasn't a vacation. If I had to have socks, if I had to pack socks, it wasn't a vacation, I was always going to the beach. Went to the beach, my wife said, let's try uh, Asheville, North Carolina. They have a lot of breweries, right? So that's how she got me. So what you do is, you, it may not be the primary thing they're looking for, right? Which would be venture capital and, and those sort of things. What you do is you find the secondary thing they're looking for and you start promoting that. And that will probably grab one or two, and if it grabs one or two, maybe it starts to grab more. But that's a really tough nut for us to crack. And so we are looking at it. We're also looking at um, companies that could be in the supply chain for technology companies, right? So if, they, if there's a, something they produce that they need, particularly this is, an, this is the alternative clean energy group, that's kind of folks that are coming out of places like MIT, but also out of Carnegie Mellon and others, even Astrobotics, though, you know, they didn't quite, they didn't quite make the moon, so that cost us a little bit <laughs> in where we, where we put our investments, but um, that those companies may have some companies here in the supply chain, and we're trying to connect them, particularly historically underserved. That's really important for us now, because if you don't know what a J40 community is, you will. Justice 40 community, and a lot of the money that these companies are getting are, are tax incentives that are based upon federal dollars. And in that federal dollars, they have to do community benefit. And so we're working with a company right now that is not even going to be locating in Beaver County. They're going to locate in um, Allegheny County. However, I know some people I got in the door and said, Danny, you can provide some of your community benefit here. We have J40 communities. We're close enough. So we're trying to capture some of that. Yes? I think I'm taking up too much time, aren't I? Oh, Dan. There's a <laughs> Thank you. He yields the time on the floor, too. A lot, and there's a various, it is, it is a, there's a lot of different owners. A lot of different reasons. Uh, no one story fits them all. In some cases, they are inherited. They don't even know they have them. Um, in some cases, they are uh, trusts. In some cases, they are people who um, had shellitis in the beginning. I mean, there was a lot of that in the, in the early beginning. And now they're left kind of holding the bag. I can tell the story. I can tell you a story of an entire town, Brownsville, Pennsylvania, that has went totally under because somebody speculated on property that there was going to be um, riverboat gambling and they bought the entire downtown. There wasn't riverboat gambling, they went bankrupt and the downtown collapsed. But we don't know why. What they tend to do, which is, the, which is a, also problematic, is they may rent the top floor and they don't care. They may turn the top floor into residential and that leaves the bottom storefronts empty and they don't care. So there are ways to get around this, right? So we've asked the municipalities to uh, adopt what are called vacancy ordinances, certain requirements that you have to do, right? One of those is you have to keep it up to code, you have to, all, all that stuff, but you also have to at least put your phone number in the window. What we all found that's starting to work, we're seeing more phone numbers in the windows. What we are finding is nobody's answering those phones. <laughs> so, right, so it's just, and there's no one way to, to so we tried, uh, the, the ordinance is stick, um, this is carrot, the $10,000 grant is carrot. Uh, the municipalities will tell you they will find folks, but when you take them to the to district court, it is on your way, right? So at, that's also an issue. But we just started, uh, this is only a year old. Uh, the grant is not even a year old. The grant's only a couple of months old. Uh, but it is a long play and it is, um, uh, Carrie's also on my board. Um, I have another board member here at DeMilo. Uh, they know this is my passion and where I came from. When I was interviewed, um, I said those things that I said when I got here. 
uh, that you can't ask people to invest in your community unless you have a community worth investing in. And if we want these things to happen, we need to figure out a way to get the, these things, these places can be the downtowns, not just for that town, but they can be the downtown for the surrounding area around them as well. And it's really important. Well, so generally what, you, and I'll be, so generally what you're trying to attract is you're trying to attract uh, young couples. I'll be absolutely honest what you're trying to attract. Um, folks that would have, folks that used to work for me a long time ago that bought places in Lawrenceville for $14,000 and then um, they're, they're probably retired now, to be honest with you, because the house, they fixed up their house for a couple thousand and the house went for some astronomical number. But those are the folks that you're trying to, at, what you want to come in because they will invest in the community. The young folks will invest in the community, will invest in housing like that, and we have examples of that. We have examples of families and others in Beaver County that have come in and bought those sort of homes and are doing them the right way, not, um, not the G word, gentrification, right? We, nobody wants to see the G word, that just drives, drives it the other direction, right? So there's a difference between difference between fair market housing and, and uh, affordable housing and market, market rate housing. Those are all, those all carry connotations with them. Um, but yeah, it's just not, and, and you have to, in the, in the la and I haven't said this since I was interviewed, so, but I have said it, is that, and I'll be honest with you, not every place is gonna win. They just aren't. Well, and that is, it is a number, it is a matter of attracting people, and I'll be honest with you, as a person in economic development, I don't care where they come from. If they, if they can work, uh, I, don't get, I, don't care, I don't care where they come from, because we have a place in, we have, I sit on the Workforce Investment Board, three counties. Uh, Washington County is one of them. Washington County now has a huge Haitian population that is coming over directly so that they can work. And it, is, it has been in that Mon Valley, and for those several companies, it has proved first a challenge. Uh, my daughter also works in workforce, as Rich knows, and she's learning to, she's learning to speak French Creole, of all languages. Uh, but, uh, but that is definitely also a way to be able to increase it. I got one more question, and I think I'm getting the hook. So I'm not sure where this fits in here, So um, yeah, so crime does get into the livability aspect of where you're, where you're at. And I will tell you that, um, I, I, I'm sorry, that I always think when I hear about those things in, in Beaver County, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I worked, on Fifth, I worked on Fifth Avenue in Pittsburgh for 17, uh, 17 years. Um, I used to walk to work from past the Wood Street garage because I parked on the other side for a long time. Um, that kind of... When that's relative, I, I just want to say that your your communities here are much safer than people give them credit for, because that is relative. Uh, they just really are, um, and that it is a part of that whole spectrum. But the idea is again, if you continue to invest in those downtowns, and take away the vacancies and take away those sort of things, and give people opportunity, those crime that those related things begin to diminish. But I do want to tell you, and, I'm, and, I, and if you're not, this is, it's all relative. The other thing about Beaver County that I also love is trying to get you people to cross a river. <laughs> Holy hell. No offense. I once told somebody I'm going to have a meeting over there, and I said, we, you can't have it over there. It's on the other side of the river. I'm on the side of the river. I, I, I don't know what it is. 
That and Rich will tell you the other thing. I'm sorry. Is, is, is somebody, I've asked everybody that I ever met that's been here a long time, please explain the fascination with Red Lobster. But that is a, a whole other subject because everybody says we don't have a Red Lobster. Thank you. That's a scary thought. I know, I know. But I think Not that that's the case, but that they'd have to pick my brain. I don't have that kind of interesting talks, so I have something to do, OK? Um, while I'm cleaning loose board, where is he? Um, the launch box, you might have a question, what is the launch box? I'll just give you a minute uh, uh, overview uh, while we are getting ready. Launch box is a Penn State sponsored program. It was started by President Barron, uh, the last president, and his idea was to use the campuses to help promote entrepreneurship and um, innovation to revitalize the economies. So if we are able to promote, encourage one entrepreneur and make them successful, they would be able to employ more and that's how it will multiply. So my job, apart from teaching, is to find people who have the desire, dream, aspirations and motivation to start something on their own, but they don't know where to start. And that's what I focus on. My area of specialization is idea generation and idea design. So if you know somebody who has ideas, not sure which one is a good one, do not have an idea, but really committed to start something on their own, have an idea, but it is half-baked, not very confident about it, I can help. So that's what my specialization is. Um, we are going to do the activity. Um, no more talks. Uh, we are going to do build a marshmallow tower. So you'll have to clean the, the table in front of you. We'll play in the team of four people. It's a delicate stuff that you'll be dealing with. So you know, you'll have to be a little bit careful. Anybody has played marshmallow tower? Okay, you guys are out. You are, you're helping me. <clears throat> so what we are going to do is, we will build the tallest freestanding structure with the marshmallow on the top, and we have only 18 minutes to do that. You have some material, you have spaghetti, sticks, really strong, right? And you have um, a marshmallow, a string, some tape, and you have 18 minutes. Let's clear up the tables and build the teams of four. Let's have fun, folks. Let's continue to talk. What happened? Some of you were planning, some of you were trying. Um, one thing interesting happened that somebody asked me in the beginning within one or two minutes that can they use the bag? Normally, the Rule is you cannot use anything else. But I have learned over the time that bag is a resource. Resources are available to us, right? So if it is a resource, we should ask ourselves, is it available to us? Can we use it or not? Lou is a resource, right? We just heard. I am a resource. So sometimes we are not aware of the resources around us, and we don't use them. The other thing happened is that they used it, they started using it, and they were going really well, but then they um, abandoned the plan. But nobody was watching them. That's the competition, right? Everybody was, nobody was aware. Some people, like, not everybody was sure, even not, you know, not aware that they were able to use the bag. Because they were using the bag, everybody else was so focused on doing their thing. That's something that also happens with us. We are not looking around and seeing 
what other people are doing. So Lou was talking about something is happening in Carnegie. They have already tried and tested it. We can do it here as well. So that's how we learn from each other, right? So that's another thing that, that happens. Um, any interesting thing happened? What was leading? Who was leading? Who made the mistakes? <laughs> Salvation actually broke, so then we had to like figure out another um, way to, to fix our um, stable. Right, right, right. So sometimes this happens. See, we we are always working with personalities. We we experience that uh, it is sometimes somebody is able to take the lead. Sometimes there are multiple leaders in the team, and it takes time to really get to right, and and and, and that's that's what happens. We make mistakes and then we learn, okay, somebody else has a better idea and that's how we, we learn as well. But let's talk about some key takeaways, right? So planning is really important, but when you are in a new environment and you are trying new things, you can't plan too much. You cannot spend too much time to plan. You will have to start uh, doing some kind of um, pilot or iterative approach uh, because that's how you learn, uh, you know, that, that how the things are going to work. So prototyping, experimenting is really important. You know what was the most important thing in this whole experiment was that we are not realizing that how heavy that marshmallow is. Yeah. Right? It, it, it doesn't look heavy. It doesn't feel heavy. It's a fluffy stuff. But when you put it on top of it, then you realize, oh my god, it is, right? And by the time we have built the tower, most of the time has gone in planning and building the tower. But as soon as you put that on that, that's where you rise. So it might be you know, easier to start a small because we don't know how heavy that marshmallow is going, going to be, right? Uh, so let's, uh, I'm gonna play this video, not the whole video, it's a six minute video though. Um, and he, this guy explains what we did um, and what, what, what people you know, learn from this as well. So let's, let's watch this. When I moved to America around 20 years back, um, one thing I really appreciated and admired was that how much time we invest in planning here. And if we are planning it really well, we execute it well as well. And then I started following that rule every time. And it was working beautifully. But then I started learning that it doesn't always work if you do not have the experience about the environment and the knowledge. So if you're dealing with new um, environment or moving parts or unknowns, it becomes much more important to prototype. And then I started teaching entrepreneurship and innovation and it became very clear that we have to experiment with our ideas so that we can learn. So we call, um, we call it a, a minimum viable product uh, Sandy is sitting here. She's done a PhD in, in, in entrepreneurship. Uh, we talked about this uh, a lot. So minimum viable product is something which is just a standing uh, you know, marshmallow there. It might be just nine inches, and you never know. You might win that, right? Uh, because other people will fail. <laughs> so, um, so, so minimum viable product is something which, which we always encourage entrepreneurs to go for. Let's start with something, minimum investment, minimum effort. Let's test the market and then go for, for, for the next level. Yeah, and that's what, see, I'm experiencing that as a teacher as well. From last few years, and especially after pandemic, the attention span of students are going down drastically, and ours is as well, right? If I'm lecturing them more than five minutes, they are tuning off. So I can, they are not listening to me at all. But when I make them do things, then they are there. None of you were thinking about your problems when you were actually doing that, right? You forgot about that 18 minutes, what's happening outside this room. And we learned things. We are not going to remember anything else after we talked about whatever we talked about. But that's what how we pick up uh, the, the knowledge and that we, we retain. So that's what I am actually experimenting with my teaching is that can I do more and more activities aligned with the, with the learning objectives?
So why this team was successful, I forgot to mention actually, I made a note, is that they actually did that. They made a, a, a tower which was working and then they said, okay, now we're gonna do more. And they could achieve that phase much earlier. So they had time to build that. And I was, mind, I'm not sure they should do that because they can still win. But uh, they did it. And, and that's, I think, because you figured out how heavy that is, and I think that that helped you, probably. Uh, so yes, iteration, iteration, iteration. Anything else? Nan? Thank you. Just thinking back over you know, five of these sessions, um, we've heard from uh, a storied journalist uh, and economic and business development professional. Uh, we've heard from a, a humanist who talked about the future of education and the value of liberal arts even in the 21st century. Uh, we heard from an arborist and a scientist. We heard from community and economic development specialists and Folks who can help you hack your creativity, and who am I missing? Oh, the movie. oh, and we watched a film together about the power of persistent community uh, in the life of, or, I'm sorry, the power of persistent creativity in, in the life of a community. And I think in some ways that arc of stories is a little bit of an illustration uh, of what we heard about tonight. Um, next time when we come together, yet to be determined sometime in April. Um, we are going to watch together um, a short film that has been produced about the East Palestine train derailment. Um, some of the folks on the Riverwise team have had the, uh, the distinct honor of following residents in East Palestine over the course of the last year. And um, some folks have uh, agreed maybe to even come and talk about their experience of living in East Palestine. And um, we're going to have a very different kind of conversation uh, next time we come together. All of that is really a, a, a rehearsal or a performance of diverse, creative, multi-perspective community voices coming together uh, in public space and negotiating together uh, a way of thinking and talking about who we are and what we want to become. And that is, in its own kind of way, the story of, uh, of the current. I jotted down a few notes, um, and I, I don't know if I can see them. They're too far, they're, they're all the way in the back and it's late. Um, I, I won't bore you with all of them, but um, my charge at the end of each of these sessions is to try to like pull things together just a little bit. Um, and so the way I've come to do that is by uh, Kind of reflecting and uh, you know offering some comments uh, about connective tissue that I hear across some of these different sessions. So I love the story that Lou shared with us. Uh, fascinating, uh, invigorating story. Fundamentally, reminding us that we attract by growing our connections. Uh, I started using the word intersectionality at the beginning of the evening. Lou. I mean, I, he couldn't have performed an intersectional story about the economic uh, vitality of our region any better than he did. Bringing together all of these different pieces, butting them up against one another and showing that the more we have relationships, processes, plans, vision, uh, agreements across all of these different elements of our community, the more likely we are to attract all the way from the $10,000 project up to you know, the multi-million dollar project. Um, so we attract by growing our connections, the first point that I took away from tonight. Um, number two, we can and must practice creativity. Um, we, I think, as a culture, or maybe just as people, tend to assume like there's these creative people over here, and then there's the rest of us, right? Um, and I think the experience of the last you know, 20 minutes or so reminds us that we can, we can actually practice creativity. We can get better at creativity. And if we do that, um, we are poised actually to do new and better and more exciting things together 
over time. All of that can lead to better connections. All of that can lead to better pieces that we're bringing to this puzzle. And as we practice our creativity together intentionally, uh, these are actually tools and resources for growing different, better, more vibrant kinds of community. I think this is the fifth lesson and I'm almost done. Um, Tonight was a really interesting reminder about creating new kinds of space. Um, we came into this room together and we created a space for a conversation um, and we created an activity that none of us would have likely had uh, on our own, right? So we must create new spaces and activities to practice and grow our creativity. I don't know how many of you out there are getting older. Um, that was a bad attempt at humor, of course. We're all getting older, right? Um, there's this thing about getting older, like we get firmer and stuck, not firmer, like firmer. We get more stuck in our ways, right? Um, we become less malleable over time. And we have to fight that, right? And people have to fight that. Institutions have to fight that. Communities have to fight that. Societies have to fight that. If we don't fight that actively, we are prone to become more and more and more like we've always, always been. And so we have to create new intentional spaces to practice those things. Last couple things I'll just say. Um, I love the notion of um, experiment, learning through experiment. Um, we need to be a community who is willing to fail drastically and to fail publicly. And if we aren't willing to do that, we will not inherit the fruit of innovation in our region. And so I love that notion that learning can come by doing, that learning can come through experimenting, and actually learning can come, maybe most of all, through failure. We need to celebrate failure uh, together more than we do um, and be willing to experience that. Not too much, that's right. You don't want all your crops to die. Um, <laughs> But maybe if one row goes down, you can learn something from it. Um, the final thing, and then I'll shut up. Um, I heard a story tonight about the incredible value of composing better teams. Now, I don't think there are perfect teams, uh, but we can get better or worse kinds of teams. And the people that you bring to the table and the way that you bring them to the table um, it really, really matters, right? And many of you spoke in different ways to that story. Um, one of the things that something like The Current is aspiring to do is to get some new teams on the field together. It's fascinating to me. We've had five different sex lectures. I don't think we've had the same, uh, the same group. I mean, it's been a very different group each time. How many of you, has anybody been to all five sessions? Anybody been to that? Been to one of them. Okay, so two. Two, anybody more than two? Three, Carrie, you're winning. Any fours? Okay, so of all those sessions, we've had, you know, uh, actually mostly new people at each session. We gotta figure out together how to curate and intentionally build new teams out of the teams that we've created, right? So how do you start lumping and lumping those things together in new and interesting and creative ways? Um, there's so many lessons in the story of this evening. And, um, you know, on the one hand, it's a conversation about economics and marshmallows. But most fundamentally, it's a conversation about the possibilities inherent in our shared humanity. If we're willing to see something different in ourselves, and if we're willing to experiment in bold and vulnerable ways toward different ends. And so I, I love that you're here. Again, I'm honored. I hope that you will have taken something from this evening and found this to be valuable. I hope that you come back next month and hear a very, very different kind of story, both of tragedy and also overcoming, um, that I think you really won't want to miss. So um, thank you to Penn State, as always. You are amazing hosts. This room is uh, quite the space. Uh, I wish I had been able to teach in a space like this. Um, all right. Uh, thank you. Go forth. Do something else. <laughs> Go forth and experiment. That's right.